Okay, so hopefully you guys all got this right. You have a physical stimulus, right? You perceive your world, you receive a stimuli. That triggers an emotion which causes you to have this feeling, okay? So this is a modern neuroscientific view of these things, but where did all this come from? We started off in the 1800s with a couple of really important theories that um, are still around today. The Cannon-Barr Theory of Emotions by uh, Walter Cannon and Philip Bard basically suggest that people feel emotions first and then they act upon them. Then you had James Lang, uh, which is you know William James and Carl Lang theory, also in the in the 1880s, and they basically said that the physiology instigates an experience of a specific emotion. So if you kind of compare these ideas, you might think that what's going on is that I'm trembling because I feel afraid, right? So you have a stimulus, this mad dog is barking at you, you feel afraid of this, and then you're going to have a, a response to this. James Lang said, basically, I'm, I'm afraid because I tremble. So I have a stimulus, I'm having an automatic response of trembling, therefore I become conscious that I'm fearful, right? Whereas Kennenbard says that here, okay, I'm having the, the dog is scaring me. This leads to this unconscious activity as well as a conscious feeling, right? So you have an unconscious and a conscious um, occurrence that happens simultaneously, slightly different, right? And then um, Satcher had another view, right? Then you have the stimulus, there's an automatic response, so then I think about what I'm feeling, and then I'm actually conscious of this feeling, right? So all of these theories have been around for, for a long time. Basically, the bottom line of these, these two biggie ideas is that one said that the physiological response leads to emotions, leads to feelings. The other said that the feelings lead to the emotions, which is leading to a physical response, right? The, the way you're screaming out loud. We basically are, are saying that, you know, Satcher's idea, James Lang's idea, this idea that you're going to perceive your world, there's going to be something that's going to happen at a physiological level, probably unconscious to you, right? This new pump of adrenaline. You might begin to feel your heart, and if you become conscious of this, if you can train yourself to understand, well, that's, you know, the adrenaline getting into my system, uh, I can take it one of two ways. I can run like crazy and, and freak out in front of the crowd, or I can stand up and I can talk, okay? So you can decide your feelings or your reaction to this later, okay? So there's several of these theories that are out there. So here's a really quick test. According to James Lang theory, the conscious experience of an emotion Da, da 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 physiological arousal. And according to the Canon Bard theory, the conscious experience of emotion, da da da, da physiological arousal. So hopefully you're thinking that according to the James Lang theory, the conscious experience of emotion follows physiological arousal. And according to the Canon Bard theory, the conscious experience of emotion coincides with the physiological arousal. Finally, in this uh, last section of part one, we're going to look at this idea of universal emotions. Uh, are there emotions that all human beings, independent of their culture, they all experience in the same way? And Paul Ekman had this idea in the 70s. He really wanted to try to see if there were faces or facial expressions that everybody around the world reacted to in the exact same way. Um, could they all consider that this was going to be angry and that this was scared and that this was disgust and this is surprise and this is happy and this is sad? Did everybody perceive that? Or, or were there such strong cultural filters that this was uh, impossible? And what he came to find is that um, based on this fusiform face area in the brain, which is kind of unique, you can get, uh, human beings can do this really well all around the world almost universally, but you can't get machines to do this yet. Machines can identify faces. But it's really hard for a machine to understand the difference between surprise and disgust or surprise and anger or uh, sadness or fear or fear and surprise. Machines aren't good at that yet. So these are some of these things that are actually kind of special about the human brain. What we find is that there is basically, there are at least six um, they've sort of subdivided one of these areas into, into a seventh area now of sadness, anger, happiness, contempt and disgust used to be stuck together. Uh, now they're sort of pulled apart here because they do tend to have different facial uh, movements, right? One's kind of smug and the other one is kind of like, you know, more overtly uh, bothered by something, right? And surprise. So these seven, six or seven key emotions are ones that um, you can go to Papua New Guinea and show these pictures of faces and people will have the same reaction as if you go to Japan or if you go to Germany, or if you go to the United States, you're going to get similar reactions to these particular facial expressions. And what Ekman actually did is document all of the different changes in facial muscles so that he could actually interpret and actually teaches people how to read um, others' faces in that way. So we know 
that seven-month-old babies pay more attention to fearful faces than happy faces. If I were to ask you why would that be such an important thing, um, what do you think is the answer? The truth of the matter is it's much more important for your survival, for the survival of the species, to know when to be afraid than to recognize happy people because happy people aren't going to hurt you, right? But it's good to be able to uh, run when it's necessary from fearful faces, right? Okay, so... We still don't know how this really works in the brain. There is, uh, there's a lot of theories out there. Some of them have to do with the mirror neuron system, which has to do with a set of neurons in the brain that react when you perceive the other doing something. So it fires both when an, when, uh, an individual acts as well as when you observe the individual doing that same act. So you can perceive, for example, if you watch a baseball game, your brain is triggering some mirror neurons which is making you sense what it must feel like to actually throw that ball, right? So you can perceive the actions of others. So this is a really complex system. It's only been um, recently studied, you know, in the in the late 90s we began to have, uh, you know, cues as to this and it's still an ongoing huge area of research, but this is uh, something that it's well worth uh, reading up on if you're interested in the whole neurophysiology of emotional states. Okay, so these are processed in the brain. Uh, we know that babies, before they're able to speak, actually do emotional processing. They understand the emotional faces of other people. Without even being able to articulate what they're feeling, they, have been able, they are able to process happy faces versus sad faces versus fearful faces. So this gets us to the big question of to what extent and to what subtle extent are these emotions uh, perceived? So we know that there's a wide spectrum of emotions. And within, for example, the emotion of anger, you have a wide spectrum of, of sensations, the same thing of joy, fear, sadness, love. So there's a bunch of people who've tried to come up with graphical representations of, of the spectrum of emotions. And I just want to share this with you because it's, it's quite um, a curiosity it's pure interpretation of what you put next to what. Uh, there's this general sense that maybe uh, love might be the opposite of something like uh, contempt or remorse or whatever, which would be you know, on the sadness scale or whatever. This is somebody's interpretation. And, and Pluchik is actually one of these uh, wonderful and very prolific writers on the field of emotions, if you want to look into his theories. Um, there's others. Uh, Takanishi has actually tried to come up with something that says, no, no, but emotions are much more three-dimensional, and it's not just on a scale of things. So there's a lot of ways to consider uh, theories of emotions. These are some of the most recent ones. Uh, you might be challenged in this class to actually think of some of your own uh, theories. Where do you find emotions? What emotions do you put next to each other on on a scale or a spectrum uh, of feeling, right? Uh, you might have seen, there are some uh, forensic papers out there that say that, you know, the strong passion and, and rage are actually pretty close to each other on these scales. So very interesting how people choose to align uh, emotional states. So we also know, um, based on Ekman's study and some of the, the work that some of his students have done, um, Mamble, she actually showed how the there is an interpretation of faces and tone of voice that are actually very quick and unconscious. Even though we might meet someone, look at them, and our outward behavior towards them could be um, totally normal, inside we're interpreting whether or not I believe him, I don't believe him, I like this guy, I don't like this guy, this guy scares me, this guy looks all right. We might not react back out of social norms, but we know that the brain does. The brain reacts totally uh, within a few, the first few seconds of contact to make a decision about whether or not we can get along with this person, we can trust this person or not. And that's really basically uh, human survival. This is the way we have to be in order to be able to, um, to make it, you know, survive through the rest of our, our, our lives. So we need to be able to know when to run, right? So now we're going to dovetail into the next theme, which will be part two, which has to do with um, emotional intelligence. What does it mean to be able to interpret or to understand, you know, that tight feeling in your stomach or that dull feeling in your legs or that heart beating really fast? Or how do we interpret that and then how do we manage that? And once we've been able to do that with our own selves, how, do, how are we able to do that or take advantage of that with other people, okay? And one of the things that uh, is very, very interesting to uh, make this link to has to do with uh, vocabulary and understanding emotions. One of the first things that we teach our teachers, you know, when you have these little kids, maybe three years old, and they're having a conflict, we try to teach them the vocabulary. We say things like, I know you're feeling angry, you know, because 
somebody did something to you, right? So first you're helping them identify what is that knot in their stomach? What is that, that you know, blood rushing to their face? What is that feeling called? What is What do we want to label that? Because that emotion, we want to do this appropriately, right? So that the student doesn't misattribute that emotion to a different feeling, right? And then we want to give him a cause and effect. I want him to understand that this feeling was caused by some action so that he can understand it's not Susie is the problem, Susie's not the problem, it's the action, okay, it's what she did that is the problem, right? So if we can get them to understand appropriate vocabulary, then understand cause and effect, um, then we can help them uh, move to the next stage when they're a bit older to understand and develop empathy. You know, but how would you feel if you got hit or something like that, or how would you feel if somebody pulled your hair? So the idea with cultivating emotional intelligence in small children has to do with this idea of helping them label what they're feeling uh, and then channeling their actions, their subsequent actions in an appropriate way. So we have several um, ideas of emotions. You'll have this something that happens to you, external stimuli, you're going to react to it. These are these um, pumping of different hormones or different things that are going to go into your bloodstream and make you want to react in a different way. And so you'll have a certain behavior. And then based on what you've just done, you might maybe get ready, uh, feel fearful, um, get this uh, rush of adrenaline, punch somebody, and then feel bad about it, right? And then you're going to have this other uh, physiological response to that and then the cycle just is unending which means that emotions are really part and parcel of your everyday life and every single action uh, that occurs. Okay with that we're going to stop here and we're going to move on into part two which has to do with emotional intelligence. I invite you to have a look at some of these extra readings uh, depending on which area of interest you have with uh, emotions and I look forward to seeing you uh, when we talk about emotional intelligence.